Most clubs trying to compete on equipment. They try and compete on the bigger, better, fancier. No. You compete on preeminence, you will dominate your competition, I guarantee you. And guess what? It costs virtually nothing. What does it really mean to be this thing called an entrepreneur? Well, to begin with, let's look at what is the definition of an entrepreneur. And if we go to the literal definition, uh, the word actually comes from an English and a French word combined, both of which really mean to undertake enterprise. And if you go to the dictionary, it'll tell you that an entrepreneur is somebody who is willing to start a commercial venture for profit and be willing to risk their own financial uh, resources in order to do that. Now, it's quite a, a clinical definition and, and quite a, a narrow term. And so really, you know, does that mean that everybody who starts a business is an entrepreneur? Well, not really, not in my experience. So I wanna give you a little bit of insight around that because it's not really important what an entrepreneur is, it really is more important of what it means to be one. And so I wanna share with you a few key points that I think will help dial you in on what it really truly means to follow the path of an entrepreneur. It's about adding value. Nothing happens in commercial enterprise, nothing happens at any level of um, exchange in life unless something is contributing to something else. It means you're looking for opportunities to add value, looking for opportunities to be able to contribute. What kind of opportunities? Well, the best way to home in on an opportunity is what you're really looking for is you're looking for pain points. Being an entrepreneur really means that you're looking to spot where the pain is in people's lives because most people will pay people to take away that pain, whether it's convenience, uh, yeah, whether it's yeah, to make something easier, whether it's to relieve themselves of burden, duties, or, or yeah, certain yeah, needs or requirements that they don't want to carry. So you know, where are the pain points? Whenever you catch yourself saying, oh damn, I wish there was an easier way to do this, Average people would just complain. Entrepreneurs go, oh, opportunity. Now, what can I spot there that I can potentially look at as an opportunity that we could commercialize in a way that helps people mitigate that pain? Now, obviously you could look at being able to provide pleasure as well, but I'm here to tell you that people will do more to avoid pain than they will to move towards pleasure. You'll find far more fruitful opportunities uh, that people are compelled to take action on than you would trying to search for pleasure things. Know the business you're in. As an entrepreneur, what it means is that you understand the business you're in. The challenge with most people is that they don't. They wear the label of the profession of the business that they're in. So, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a dentist. Really? Yeah, I have a practice on, on the high street. Well, then you're not a dentist. You are in the business of marketing and providing dental services, and you just so happen to be damn good at doing the technical work yourself. But you're not a dentist, you are an entrepreneur who happens to be supplying yeah, the dental market, and as a result as well, you're qualified to conduct the work yourself. But yeah, if you start seeing yourself, oh, I am a dentist, then unfortunately you start restricting the mindset of an entrepreneur because you start falling into being a technician. Just because they feel that they're qualified to do the technical work of that business, that they then are under the illusion that they're qualified to run a business that does that technical work. And unless you switch your identity, you are a technician trying to be an entrepreneur rather than the other way around. Far better to be an entrepreneur who happens to also be good at the technical side. A better question to ask yourself is not, what have I got to do? Ask yourself, what is my outcome? Because once you start looking at it in terms of what is my outcome, your to-do list shifts. Because is it possible to have three things on your to-do list that relate to the same outcome, but you could probably achieve that outcome with two of them? Hmm. You see, if you're, your brain is focused on thinking that you're being productive by ticking stuff off, for a start, you're homing in on dead the wrong things because you're going for the fastest thing to tick to feel good about it. But more importantly, you're focusing on crossing stuff off rather than understanding the reason why you're crossing stuff off. Does that make sense? So, you know, what is my outcome? What am I really trying to achieve here? And then you could probably start shifting. Because as soon as you get locked in into a to-do mentality, you, that's it. Deaf, dumb, and blind. You're, you're off chasing that rabbit, thinking that you're doing good. 
So ask yourself a better question. What's my outcome? Not what have I got to do? If you make that one distinction, it can completely shift the entire course of how you focus on planning your day. Plan and allocate how much time you'll need to complete each task. No, this is not the amount of time that you're going to spend today, but how much in total on each of the lists. Yeah, and then you add up the amount of time, say it's five to six hours, and we do it for the six most important tasks. Then we plan the day and assign time slots for working on and accomplishing each task. We schedule the day in sections, allocate time on each in a manageable chunks, and stick to the plan. Focus on the difficult projects first. That is, you can't do that if you are to-do list focused. To-do list will focus on which tasks first. The easiest ones you can cross the hell off the list so you can feel good about it. Spend 80% of your time on the things that get results, not 20. The traditional yeah, approach is the 80-20 in the opposite direction. If you can shift that, you will dramatically shift the productivity of your business and your life. Hard easy is what separates the masters. Most people that are not masters of this go for easy hard. And they keep pushing off the hard, which is why it's still on the to-do list three weeks later. And yeah, your accountant's screaming at you to get your tax return done. Yeah, deadlines can be wonderful things. But if you start with a focus of hard, easy is the new easy to move my business forward, you can start shifting that mentality. One of the stories I get asked to share quite a lot is how did I start my first business? Now, some of you may know, you know I dropped out of school at 16. I had no qualifications. I certainly didn't have any money or access to traditional business building resources like capital or lines of credit or good ideas. You know, I was born on a low-cost housing estate in the a middle of a place called Leicester in, in England. And so, yeah, it doesn't get much lower than that in terms of yeah, stacking the deck against you to start a business. And there's many, many people that started with far, far less than I did and went on to create far more success than I have. So never use that as an excuse. But how did I start? You know, I dropped out of school at 16 and I, I worked for my father for a short while. I don't recommend that. You know, he had his own little business. It was a, a scrapyard and I was being paid far less than I wanted, which is a lesson. You should never work for your parents because they don't pay you enough. But I, was, uh, I had this belief system, and I said to my dad, I said, listen, I'm leaving at the end of the week. He said, what are you getting into? I said, well, I don't know, but I have a belief that says if you jump in the deep end, you can only swim. I still have that belief today. And he paid me my, my week's wages, which was 40 pounds, about $60. And I paid my mom what I owed her for, for rent, yeah, for board, I paid my friend yeah, some money and I had my last 20 pounds left to my name. And I thought, I know, I'll, I'll start selling toys on what we call car boot sales or flea markets. What I did was I went to a wholesaler and I walked in and I started walking up and down the aisles pretending that I owned the place. And the guy came up and said, excuse me, do you have a trade account with us, sir? And I said, no, I don't. But yeah, I will soon. He said, what do you mean? I says, well, I'm a market trader. I specialize in toys. Yeah, I have stalls at all of these different places. And what I was actually doing at the time was I was telling the truth in advance. Now, that was my version of it at the time. But I said, uh, somebody recommended you, but I've been using so-and-so. And I mentioned the next one down in the yellow pages. And he says, oh, certainly, would you like an account? I'm like, let's do it. So I looked around and I bought 15 pounds with the toys. And I went to a car boot sale. I couldn't afford a table. My mom had given me a blanket and I put a blanket on the floor. In the middle of this field, I put my toys on and I tried to sell them. But I sold them all for 25 pounds. So I went back the next day and I bought yeah, 25 pounds of the toys. I went and I put my uh, five pounds through the uh, window for the car boot sale. And from there, I sold it again and I built up and up over about five or six weeks until I got enough to just cover a normal market stall. Yeah, I left my dad in June and by October, I'd made my first thousand. And I was so chuffed because I'd made it and not earned it. And there's a big difference. From there, you start to understand that nobody can take your toolbox away. Yeah, if you go out and you start something, anything, don't be disheartened, just keep going. There's always a way, my friends. And if I can start from nothing and thousands and millions of people have started with nothing, you can start with nothing. You don't need money to start a business. I built a chain of health clubs across Europe, which I started and founded in 2002. And yeah, I, I sold it at 27 clubs, I think, around about 2005. Uh, it's just opened its 100th club last year. Very proud of them. It's, it's a great legacy, and they're doing really well. But I couldn't compete with the Fitness First and the David Lloyds because they had big budgets, and I didn't. But what I could compete on is preeminence and customer service. 
And so all of our clubs had a $500 a month, what I call raving fan fund, whereas for every single person, whether it was the gym manager or the manageress, yeah, the aerobics instructor, the beauty therapist, or the person that swept up the aerobic studio at night, had authority without question to request $50 from the safe for solving guest problems. Now, when I first introduced that, my other directors looked at me and said, whoa, whoa, what do you mean? I said, trust me, right? Give it time. The hardest thing was to get them to spend it. And I was like, if there's any money in the safe at the end of the month, I want to know why, because you're not looking for opportunities to impress enough. And examples. Guy walks in on his mobile phone through the turnstile. He's complaining to his friend that you know, he's just got a puncture in his car, and you know, he's all a bit you know, riled up about it. Our receptionist has top sensory acuity, as all of our staff were trained to hunt for opportunities to impress. Yeah, he comes down an hour and a half later after his workout. I says, oh, Mr. Smith, uh, I couldn't help but overhear that you, um, you had a puncture. And uh, when you went to your workout, I went out, I saw in the car, it's obviously a nail, it's our car park, our nail will take responsibility for that. While you were training, I had somebody come in mobile quick fit to change your tire and we've washed your car. It's ready for you. Wow is what, the wow factor is what we were looking for. Right? Guys, it costs 40 bucks. Again, if I'd have put that 40 bucks in an advert next to Fitness First, what would have happened? <laughs> It's not difficult, you know? Massage therapist, um, off sick, woman turns up. Oh, Mrs. Jones, I'm very sorry, we tried to get hold of you, but your phone's been switched off. Um, unfortunately, your therapist isn't here today, she's, she's sick. We tried to reschedule the appointments, we've rescheduled everybody else, but we couldn't get hold of you. So, um, I'm very sorry, but the therapist isn't available. However, we've booked a, set, uh, a massage for you at a rival health club just down the road, compliments on us, and there's a taxi waiting outside for you. 50 bucks. What is Mrs. Jones saying? Right? Is she going to go down the road just because they've got a better treadmill? No. Most clubs trying to compete on equipment. They try and compete on the bigger, better, fancier. No. You compete on preeminence, you will dominate your competition, I guarantee you. And guess what? It costs virtually nothing.